Joining us now exclusively on his 59th <laughs> birthday, which he probably doesn't want me to say, here at Post 9, we have Michael Corbett, CEO of City. Michael, great to see you. Good morning. It's great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. In April, you were in front of uh, Congress, and you said our ability to talk ourselves into the next recession could occur. I thought that was a great, uh, a great note, because what it says is confidence sometimes can trump even robust employment. Can you explain to people at home how you talk yourself into recession? Sure. So actually, the line, the line, Jim, came when on our uh, fourth quarter earnings call in early January, an analyst asked me, what were the biggest risks that I saw? And I said, one of my biggest fears is that we're, we're potentially in the process of talking ourselves in the next recession. And when you think about this economy, so much of its confidence, consumer confidence, and in particular, business confidence, a lot of what the tax stimulus was meant to do. And business wants consistency, it wants clarity. And I think the fourth quarter was very unsettling, in particular to business. And I think a great barometer, and David, you've talked about it, is M&A, and where we see that, um, you know, despite this backdrop, we've got M&A down 17 percent. And if it weren't for a couple big, chunky deals, we'd probably be down well into the 20s. That's confidence in the C-suite. And businesses are not planning for the next 30, 60, 90 days. We're planning for three years, five years, seven years. And if you start to, to see some of these signs and you start to see, get some of these fears and we start with the rhetoric of slowdown and recession, people have a tendency to pull back. And so uh, I was really glad to see that coming into the first quarter, we rebounded, uh, that confidence has, begin, has begun to come back. And I think back by the numbers uh, where we came in on growth at 3.2 percent, we'll see tomorrow. But the jobs reports last month was pretty strong. So I'm hoping that we're healing some of that rhetoric that's been out there. Yeah, well, we may even see a bit of a bounce in M&A as well. I'm curious, though, we know you as a global bank, and there does seem to be more, to your point, um, positive sentiment about our economy here. But what about Europe? Mm -hmm. What about Asia, where obviously you have very important franchises? Uh, I think the sense is Europe in particular is a real weak spot in the global economy. Yeah, I, Do you, you agree? Know, if we look at today, I think that the numbers that have come out have, have re-energized people in terms of where the U.S. economy is. I think the other surprise in the first quarter, second quarter, has really been China, that we were fearing a China slowdown. We talked about a lot of China stimulus being put forward in the second half of last year and in, into the first quarter. I think that's now taken, taken seed. And I think we see a Chinese economy that's stabilized. I think it feels better. Clearly, trade talks feel like they've got a bit of momentum. So I think we could continue to see that trajectory. But as you say, I think the, the, the weak link out there is away from the two bookends of the U.S. and China, and it's really Europe. And how does Europe kind of break itself into a better growth cycle? And, you know, we've had some slowing. We're back in more negative rates in some territories. And that's tough to overcome. Is it? Yes. Yeah. So what, what gets you there, then? Because we've been having that conversation right. for a long time. I think it takes the rest of the world. I think it takes the rest of the world to stay on track. What we've said, if Europe just continues to need time, time to heal, time to get the growth, um, they're going through some electoral, electoral things. Obviously, we've got Brexit continuing to be there. Maybe it'll be there for a while. And so I think it just needs time. Well, Mike, I want to speak to the inexpensive nature of city stock. You've been buying back stock, you've been 7 8 percent of it. The market's not giving you any credit, I feel, because for 17 months now, your stock's pretty much been, hasn't really moved. How do you explain to people why it's so good to buy back stock at tangible book value and how it, that ultimately you're going to produce fabulous earnings growth at the same time shrink the huge number of shares that you have? Right. Well, uh, since I've become CEO, we've sh taken our share count down by over 25 percent. The past year, we took them down by about 9 percent. And so we get that embedded EPS growth in share buyback first quarter, we bought back about $5 billion worth of stock. A couple of years ago, we talked about a plan to go in and return at least $60 billion of capital to our shareholders over a three or over three CCAR cycles. Two-thirds of the way through, we're over $40 billion of that done. Obviously, the end of June, we'll get our next series of results, and we hope to, to tick that box as having done that. And as, as you talked about, that, you know, returning that, reducing the share count, getting the embedded EPS growth. So a bit of top line growth, good expense discipline, share buyback, return on, return of capital. 
You mentioned confidence, uh, business confidence, planning. And on the manufacturing front, we've seen some surveys roll over mm -hmm. in Chicago, ISM. I saw some reaction yesterday that it was some of it's due to trade, worries about trade, even some worries about the southern border. How much is riding on us getting a trade deal with China in two weeks, ostensibly now? Uh, I think expectations, Carl, are there that uh, we're going to get something done in the second quarter, in the next few weeks. If we don't get it, I think there'll be a lot of disappointment, and I think you'll see some of those fears come back. Uh, we're optimistic that we think we're going we're gonna to get something done. And again, going back to where we started the conversation, business wants clarity. Business wants the ability to plan and predict. And if your supply chain whether it's coming from the southern borders or whether it's coming from Asia, from China, uh, whether it's coming from Europe and you don't have clarity in terms of your supply chain, you're having to plan for that or plan alternatives for that, and that's unsettling. Did Powell's explanation about transitory nature of inflation make sense to you yesterday? I think so. Uh, you know, you, you look and you say, listen, we've got the S&P at a high. We, we, we just posted 3.2 percent growth. I don't know how you cut rates in that environment, right? And I give the Fed a lot of credit. One is putting credibility back into the balance sheet. You know, we don't see it in the near term. At some point, we will get a recession. We want a balance sheet that's credible. We want rates in a position where the Fed has the ability to act and stimulate the economy. And so uh, we didn't see, I didn't see anything that led me to believe that we should be cutting rates, that we should have cut rates yesterday. I think that there's a bizarre nature to this market. If you have fintech, so to speak, you have fintechnology, people pay pretty much anything for you, 30, 40 times earnings. If you're a regular bank with some good growth and good balance sheet, they don't give you much credit. You have a, for instance, you have a treasury and trade solutions. Michael, if you bought that public, it might be worth half of your valuation. How do you, as a traditional banker, look at a company like a Square or anything in payments and say, you know what, that's just not worth as much as my own internal business? Well, uh, you know, one is, as you mentioned, our Treasury Trade Solutions, a number of our businesses, you know, we had a, I think what I would describe as a real solid first quarter across the board. Good, good growth in terms of our credit card business, good growth in terms of, uh, of our investment banking business, our fixed income business, materially outperformed the street around the globe, Mexico, Asia, good growth. And then our annuity businesses, Treasury Trade Solutions and Security Services, 7% growth. And by the way, I think it's the 15th consecutive quarter of year-over-year -year earnings growth in that business. So uh, it, it, I think it is an underappreciated asset and just something through time we're going to continue to show the value in. Uh, Michael, something that caught some investors' eye was Value Act uh, taking a fairly significant position and sort of reaching an agreement with you guys in terms of supporting management, at least until the end of this year. Can you give us any insight on terms of the relationship with that uh, large, usually now very long-term investor, mm -hmm. um, and how you're working with them, if you are at all? Sure. So we signed, we signed, David, a cooperation agreement to share some information with them. As you cite, and as we did our due diligence, they've been constructive owners and holders of company stocks over time. Listen, if they have great ideas, we're, we're wide open to them. So we've engaged them. We've, we've talked about, we've been very transparent with everybody in terms of our plan and the things that we're doing, and we believe we're executing against it. Uh, we've been educating them. I think we've been in constructive dialogue with them, and we you know, continue to plan to do that going forward. Um, I also note that you have a relatively new chairman, CFO, head of ICG, uh, even U.S. consumer. There's a lot of new people potentially bringing new perspectives. Is that something you were seeking? And do you expect that perhaps there's going to be a different decision making than there has been in the past as a result of those new positions or new people in them? Yeah. So when you, you talk about new people, they're new to their positions. They are not new to our firm. Right. They've been there. They've been coming up through the ranks. They've earned these opportunities. And what I would describe is when you look at the people who are leaving, retiring, a lot of generational movement. We've had tremendous stability, and we've been building a bench, and I couldn't be happier or prouder of the people and, and also, you know, to congratulate the people who've been in those seats and done a terrific job. Speaking of the ranks, uh, it seems like every day there's an executive comp story. And you were asked on the Hill about your executive pay ratio and what employees should think about it. And you basically said, I would hope that it's aspirational to our rank and file. Did that answer resonate when you got back home? I, I hope so, because my answer is I am that person. I started at our firm in 1983 at $17,000 a year, and I 
you know, through the grace of God, through work, hard work, got to where I am. So I am that person that looked up and said, maybe if I work hard enough, I can get there. But if the ratio is what it is, what is the, what's the upside limit? There must be a ceiling somewhere before it gets absurd. Well, I, I think in there, the, 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 numbers, the numbers are challenged themselves, Carl, because they're not apples to apples. We run, we've got 200,000 people, many of them outside the United States. You have 40,000 people in Mexico. I've got people in the Philippines. I've got people. And so to compare city against a, a, a U.S. company, our average employee in the United States makes right at about $100,000 a year. Let me ask you about something that happened yesterday. You're a traditional banker, 1983, been around. Uh, did you ever think that you would have a, this kind of silly site called Twitter? And the president would urge the Fed chief to cut rates down to one, and it would be taken seriously? I would say today, in those 36 years, Jim, I would say more and more, nothing surprises me. <laughs> All right. And I want to speak to something personally that, that you did. Uh, a little more than a year ago, you set restrictions on firearms by business customers. Has it hurt business? Has it helped? Has it mattered? And why'd you do it? I think. As expected, when we, when we put out our policy, and it was put out in the form of a policy, we got reactions on both sides. There were, were, there were those that applauded and felt that it was a great move. And again, you just look at yesterday, North Carolina, closing day of school. We've got to do something about it. And there were those who were, who were adamantly against it, believing the business shouldn't be taking Second Amendment stances. Ours wasn't a Second Amendment stance. It was simply around what we believed was a, a push around some best practices that might help a, a challenge. Well, but you've got so many of these hair trigger policy decisions. Uh, for example, sponsoring an event with the president of Brazil and knowing what he has said about LGBT. I mean, yeah. how, do you, how do you balance all of those things? You know you're going to get blowback. Yeah, but I think most importantly, we, we spend a lot of time making sure our people understand the values of our company. And I hope in the case of that, there's no question in terms of our support, our unwavering support for our LGBT community. And, you know, in there, we're supporting the Brazilian Chamber of Commerce. We've operated in Brazil for, for many, many decades. And, um, you know, I think we're very clear in terms of our stance. And, but we spent a lot of time, Carl, making sure that we're communicating those messages and that we're clear with our people. Did uh, anyone follow? This, I'm sorry. Sorry. Earlier this week, I uh, sat down with David Solomon, CEO of Goldman Sachs. You know, we talked a lot about the changes at that institution that seem to be, or not seem to be, are much more focused on the consumer, on building a mass affluent brand and a platform to service them. More potentially of competition for some of your franchises. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a potential competitor in the future? Do you think that they have an opportunity to succeed at Goldman? I, you know, again, I think that the, that the, the strategy is one that I've read about is, you know, is a bit of a niche strategy in terms of the wealthy or ultra wealthy trying to, to kind of cater and get deposits. Consumer and, loans, consumer deposits. I mean, yeah. it's, it's and, you know, it's not your typical investment banking strategy. And, and, but I would also describe that it's not necessarily your typical run of the mill high street, main street, consumer bank either. Right. And so from our perspective, we think we've got the ability to combine the best of both, of having the physical presence and being able to provide that experience, and at the same time, investing heavily into technology. And if you looked at what we talked about on our first quarter earnings call, was de novo around some experimenting we're doing. We grew a billion dollars of consumer deposits online just kind of experimenting in some new ways of attracting new customers to the bank. Well, excellent. I want to thank Michael Corbett and his wife, Don, who's here, and your daughter. I think that I always like to point out that when someone brings their family, you kind of get a, get a kick out of it. <laughs> Michael Corbett is the chairman and CEO of City. Uh, great to see you, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.